Welcome to St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church. We're excited that you've joined us uh, today. May you encounter the living God as you worship with us. Let's pray. Father, we praise and adore you. You are worthy to be praised. Almighty God, how wonderful you are. Creation cries out in awe of your power. The universe shines with your glory and greatness. Almighty Lord, how majestic you are, each atom and molecule carrying a tiny part of your plan. Every microbe speaks of your breathtaking beauty. Almighty Father, how awesome you are. The mountain ranges ref reflect your heights and the gentle valleys your mercy. Almighty One, how creative you are, each tree and flower filled with your wonder and bounty. Each Life resounds with intricacy and miracles. I will lift my eyes to you, my wonderful, majestic and awesome God. Father, we ask for forgiveness for our arrogance and our greed and our pride. Fill us with the fruit of your spirit. Transform us into the people that you want us to be. Thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Let us pray. Let us, let us pray. Lord, you made all things so beautiful, all things so wonderful and precious. You told the sun exactly where to rise each and every morning. And you structured the sky where each star was carefully placed, handcrafted by you. You also told the ocean it can come this far on land as the waves break at the shore, keeping your promise of not flooding the land. Simple things such as these are amazing to us, your children, and we are grateful for every detail and effort you placed as you created this astonishing world that we live in. Father, we pray for those who need hope in the darkness right now. We pray that you'll surround them with your love, embrace them with your comfort, fill them with your praise. I ask this in your, your name. Amen. How much have letters played a role in your life? There's a new series on Netflix called, uh, in fact, it's a movie called The Last Letter for Your Lover, and it's a love story. A journalist discovers the letters that this man writes to his love and helps reconnect them to each other. My first girlfriend and I wrote a lot of letters to each other, and Petra and I also wrote letters to each other, especially when I was uh, doing my national service, but we weren't going out yet. And she says that she's got letters that I wrote to her when I was doing my national service that she still can't read. And there's a reason that my teachers said my handwriting looks like hieroglyphics. Today we have so many uh, different means of communication available to us. And then communication is instant. Imagine a world where there were no telephones to communicate. Between Britain and South Africa, you needed to write a letter and wait for months to get a reply. Or having a husband fighting a war and not being able to make contact with him. And sending letters and not even being sure whether they have arrived. Today it's take your pick. WhatsApp, email, Facebook, Messenger, Telegram, and that's just the text apps. Not to mention Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet. Uncapped, unlimited Wi-Fi means that we can talk on video, just audio for hours. Remember the fax machine? or the telegram, and then of course, people communicate with large groups of, of people through writing books. Amazon has got 32.8 million books for sale. The Bible is central to us as followers of Jesus. We can be grateful to the historians, the poets, the prophets, and letter writers who put pen to paper, and as a result, we have this library of books we call the Bible. In Habakkuk chapter 2, we read, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation, and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. God says to Habakkuk, Send out this message, send out these words that I'm saying to you, but make it simple and easy to read so that the message can go out to everyone. And this is not the first time or the last time that God tells someone to write something down. In Revelations, uh, God says to John, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. In Jeremiah, we read, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land I gave to their fathers and they shall take the possession of it. We have a Bible because many people wrote down what God said to them. They recorded prophecies and visions, and they wrote letters. In Hebrews we read, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In Psalm, the psalmist writes, Psalm 119, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Paul writes in Timothy, um, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be, com may be competent and equipped for every good work. 
Isaiah writes, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. In Proverbs, the author writes, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Because it was written down, the, this conversation between God and Habakkuk has been preserved so that we too can learn from this conversation between Habakkuk and God. We can relate to and identify with the frustration and the disillusionment of Habakkuk. Because it was written down, this revelation is sent out to the nations, giving them insight on what is going to happen and why. At one stage, I used to keep a journal of my conversations with God, and it's amazing to go back and read 10 years or 20 years later. It's really something I need to start doing again. And so why don't you join me? Why don't you start a prayer journal? Why don't you write down the prayers that you're praying to God and write down the answers that you believe God is giving you? Sometimes he speaks through scripture and sometimes it's a whisper in your mind. Read the written word and write down your conversation with God like the psalmists and the prophets did. And so what was this message that God wanted Habakkuk to write down and send out to the nation? The first thing God tells Habakkuk is to wait. In verse 3 we read, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for us. It will certainly come and will not delay. We've spoken about waiting in this series. None of us like to wait. Habakkuk did not like this message of having to wait. Children do not like having to wait for Christmas presents on Christmas Day or Easter eggs on Easter Sunday. And yet God teaches us a, a lot through waiting, through learning patience. We learn how to trust him. Our faith grows when we experience the revelation that we've been waiting for. Habakkuk is waiting for an answer from God as to why God would use an evil nation like Babylon to punish the people of Israel. In which area of your life is God telling you to wait? There's a saying that says good things come to those who wait. We live in an instant world, instant coffee, instant messaging, instant meals. We get annoyed when we have to stand in a queue at home affairs for five hours. But when God says wait, trust him. The second thing God says to Habakkuk is about the Babylonians and in chapter 2. And it's almost as if God is saying to Habakkuk, if you give them enough rope, they will hang themselves. God says that they're puffed up, that they're arrogant, that they're greedy. And then he also tells Habakkuk what they're not. He's, he says that they are not upright, that they are never at rest. In other words, they're restless. He says that they are never satisfied. You see, the desire of Babylon is to become a superpower in the region and it's rooted in their puffed up arrogance and greed. We've seen this kind of arrogance and greed with every superpower that has existed, whether it's the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, or the American Empire. Arrogance and greed are at the root of the desire to become a great wealthy nation, conquering and exploiting other nations, and then protecting their monopoly and wealth. We see similar things with companies and even churches. In South Africa, we've got many companies that are monopolies and protect their monopoly and engage in anti-competitive behavior. And I think arrogance and greed are usually at the root of this kind of dominance. And it always comes at the expense of other smaller companies. We also find the same thing with people, with families. Arrogance and greed. Jim Collins, a student of successful companies, did a study of why companies fail. And the conclusion it comes to is that the first step in the decline is hubris or arrogance. And the second step is the undisciplined pursuit of more. God says to Habakkuk that an evil enemy like Babylon are never at rest and never satisfied. Jim Collins says the third stage is denial of risk and peril. Because the undisciplined pursuit of more puts a country or a company at risk of stretching themselves too thin, too much credit, 
unnecessary risks and then ignoring the warning signs. And they are normally whistleblowers who raise the red flag and warn that something is wrong. These countries or companies may look healthy on the outside, but there is a rot that is started on the inside. I think if we did an analysis of, of, of all the superpowers that have existed in the world, we would find these patterns and we would find these same traits that God identifies in the Babylonians. In the Babylonians. But we too are guilty of arrogance and greed. We also get puffed up. Last week, the St. Stephen's Worship Service uh, YouTube clip had 71 views. And there's the temptation for me to become puffed up or arrogant and to want more views. But it's got nothing to do with me. It's not about me. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the word of God going out into the world to touch people, to comfort people. God calls us to be faithful. So in, in what of your life do you struggle with being puffed up, being arrogant, and being greedy? Proverbs chapter 16 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder. With the proud. But I think God's description of the Babylonians is relevant to Judah as well. They are about to be punished and face the consequences of their evil and injustice, and the root of that is being puffed up and arrogant and greedy. In the final section of Habakkuk chapter 2, God tells Habakkuk what the consequences will be for the Babylonians for their puffed upness, greed, and arrogance. He says, The nations will taunt them with ridicule and scorn, and the nations will say, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself worth wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey, because you have plundered many nations. The people who are left will plunder you, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed, and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? God is speaking to Habakkuk and he's saying, don't worry about the Babylonians. They are going to get what is coming to them. People are going to mock them. They're going to experience the consequences of their actions. They've piled up stolen goods. They've plundered many nations. They've shed human blood. They've destroyed land and cities. They've built their houses by unjust gain. They've plotted the ruin of many peoples. It goes on and on. And two thoughts come to mind for me. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And the second is your sins will find you out. The man with the Mercedes who stole from Woolworths has been arrested. The police have been confiscating stolen goods. Neighbors are blowing the whistle and pointing out stolen goods. They've even found the blue couch. As traumatic as the scenes in Durban were, people out there are starting to experience the consequences for their actions. There is hope in the darkness. And so I'd like to conclude with four points. The first is, be grateful for the written word of God. It is a comfort during dark times. And then write down your conversations with God. This the second is wait for God's revelation and be patient. He will speak and he will reveal. The third is be humble and not arrogant and greedy. The fourth is be sure your sins will find you out. The written word is all about Jesus. He is the one who gives us patience and humility. He is the one who humbles those who are corrupt and arrogant. And we can trust him to do that. And he is the one who gives hope in the darkness. Amen. There is a 
As we go out into the world, may we be your hands and feet. May we take your love, your mercy with us as we interact with people who are sad, people who are suffering, people who are desperate. It is you, Jesus, who are the hope in the darkness. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever until Jesus comes again. Amen. <laughs>